Here, holy woolly, Sherborne clay, takes up its last abode. His soul is ta'en some other way, I fear the left hand road. Stop there he is as sure as a gun, for silly body see him, no wonder he's as black the grun. Observe the standing way him. Your Brunstein devil ship I see has got him there before ye. But hold your nine tail cat a wee to lane she heard my story. Your pity I will not implore, for pity ye have nane. Justice, alas, has given him o'er, and mercy's day is gain. But hear me, sir, deal as ye are, look something to your credit. Coofle at him would stain your name. If it were kenned, ye did it. But the UK possibly making the decision on the 7th of May, we ask, what restrictions would you like to see remain in place, even when the coronavirus is over? This could be anything from maintaining social distancing to working from home. We also have a special interview with stand-up comedian Chris Thornburn, who will be speaking about life on the comedy circuit, as well as how he's adapted to the changes during lockdown proceedings. We'll also have a reading from David Westwood, who is the president of the Airdrie Robert Burns Society. But before that, we're going to play a song by Robbie McFalls. Robbie afforded his first solo single, The Morning After, and released it self-published on Amazon Music in 2016. So I hope that you'll join me in supporting Robbie's venture into music so that Airdrie is known for much more than holding an orange walk every July and a court judge that got done for soliciting. In fairness, I actually met said judge when I was 17. Not in that way. I actually met him at a works night out and he was alright. Smart. Funny. Anyway, I digress. This is Robbie McFalds with his song The Morning After. Four fifteen in the morning. The sun is up and the day is done. And then you just missed your best friend calling again. Do you remember when? Talking about all the places we could go Looking up to the sky and wondering why We can stay here forever
Fantastic. That was Robbie McFalds with his song, The Morning After. Okay, let's dive in to today's discussion. Our topic of discussion today is, what would you like to see remain in place after coronavirus ends? To clarify, this is the some of the safety measures that have been in place since we've been in lockdown since the pandemic began. I have a few ideas of my own, obviously, otherwise I wouldn't be bringing the topic of discussion up on this show. But I also went onto Facebook and asked the general question on my profile page to see what some of my friends thought as well. Now, I'll give some of my own personal opinions and some of the opinions from the comments on Facebook and we'll see if we can try and find a consensus as to what we would really like to see remain in place. I'll also be trying to hit some cons as well for these ideas even though what well, some of them I think should remain in place I know other people will think that it's probably a bad idea. So we'll kick off with the one which I think everybody would really agree on is keeping the hand washing routine and the sanitizers. Because it's quite surprising that we're in 2020 and a lot of people did not know how to wash their hands properly. Now that is, it's really shocking, if I'm honest. It's one of the things that I've been teaching my two year olds to do. Well, and they can do it pretty damn well. And there's some people that are my age or older and don't understand proper hand sanitizing or hand washing routines. So I think that really needs to be looked at. One of the things that a lot of people have agreed on on social media when posing this question is keeping the community spirit alive. Leanne Cox commented saying, hopefully people will continue to shop at their local shops. The fruit shop, butchers and bakers here have been great and they're doing home delivery, etc. But it would be a shame if people just switched back to using supermarkets when this is all over. Mary Lorimer has also commented saying, People need to remember their local shops who have been epic and I hope everyone continues to support them. They are essential to our community. Now, I really agree with this point as well, Matt, because the local shops and businesses are the ones that will struggle during this pandemic. Well, they don't have the funding, they don't have necessarily the government backing or support to survive this pandemic. While there are uh, some budgetary measures in place, well, that money won't last forever. So any businesses that do survive that are local, I really do believe that we should go out of our way to support them. Some of the cons down to that is purely laziness from people because Take myself, for example, well, I work in the city centre, so there's plenty of shops around uh, where I work. And most of them are ones like Tesco Extras, Sainsbury's, Pound Stretchers, Pound World. Well, so you would think at the end of the day, say Friday, four o'clock, I'd be wanting to get home to help look after my kids and put them to bed. So I wouldn't be thinking, right, well, I'm going to leave my work and then head to my local shop, pick up said supplies, double back to come back to the house, look after the kids. Whereas I could just go, right, I work in the city centre, I finish at four, Pound Stretchers and Tesco are both right next door to me. I'll just nip in there, get them, and it saves a bit of time so I can get more quality time with the kids. Now that's down to my pure laziness, and I know that, and that's probably something that I'll have to change if I want to keep helping local communities survive. And when the pubs, the restaurants, what well, all open back up again. One thing that I will advise is that we take a bit of time to remember some of the crap that's actually went on during this pandemic. Prime example, the owner of Witherspoons telling his employees, we're not going to furlough you, maybe try working at Tesco. Now when the pubs open back up again, well, what are people going to naturally assume? Are they going to go to their local where it's maybe, what, three, four pound a pint, well, and keep them going, or are they gonna just flock back to the Witherspoons because it's two pound for a pint of Carlsberg? I really, really hope that that doesn't happen. I'm really hoping that they stick with the boycotts, well, and just say, you know what, you treated your employees like shit, so fuck you, because damn it, I sure am. I'm not gonna be going to uh, uh, Witherspoons at any point. I really hope that it bombs I'll be supporting my local, the Eagle Inn, and making sure I get there, well, whenever the wife lets me out. And another uh, 
scam that's been going on. I've seen this recently. Is one of the day-to-day -day shops that's in Whitlet Street in Coatbridge. Now there's been a shortage of Coatbridge's legendary tonic, Buckfast. Now it's not something that I particularly enjoy, but well, it's essentially considered the holy grail well, in Coatbridge. It's up, up there with, you know, it's Buckfast, Celtic FC, well, and probably in that order. Now, the day-to-day -day shops well, have been selling these bottles of Buckfast for £15 a bottle. Now, you're probably thinking, well, a bottle of wine's about well, £15 for a decent bottle of wine, so what's what's the complaint here? Buckfast is usually between six to seven pounds for a bottle. Six to seven pounds and they're selling them for 15 pounds. That is a fucking disgrace. They're trying to do every little trick they can to keep themselves alive. Which, in fairness, if you're a shop owner and maybe your business is on its arse, I could understand that. But, really? Buckfast? 15 pound a bottle of Buckfast? Get yourself a fuck. I don't mean this, well, actually I do mean this in a bad way. So, boycott that fucker. Boycott them. Don't go back. Go to any, any other shops that are kicking about that are a bit more local and give them the support. But we're still on the subject of supporting your local community. And Guthrie agreed with Leanne Cox as well, saying, I've had deliveries from local butchers, fruit and veg deliveries, and even ice cream from a local producer. I will definitely continue to support them after lockdown as the service has saved me the stress of going out. As the click and collect has also been a godsend for minimising contact with people. And that leads me to probably my next point, which is keeping some social distancing measures in place. Now just to clarify, I am not saying that we should be what, staying away from family and friends and having to isolate and things like that because that is something that we, is part of the community spirit is keep well, making sure that you look after your family and checking on your friends that's vital what i'm meaning is people seem to not understand what it's like to feel s social anxiety especially during times like this so having those specific guidelines of staying two meters apart has been really good for people that suffer from that type of illness I don't like people invading my own personal space. My personal space is actually a lot closer than the two metres apart. So if I don't like it and I'm a bit closer, imagine somebody who's got a real case of social anxiety. Even then, some people still aren't obeying the rules. You look at it and you think, what is so hard to comprehend? But some people are having a bit of trouble with this. So I'm going to try and explain it as best I can using an example from my household. As many people who know me know, I am a father of twin boys, and they tend to like to get into a bit of a scrap every now and then. What? And that requires us having to, essentially, social distance them. Which is, put one line down the middle, put one boy on one side, put one boy on the other, and tell them, do not cross that line until you've cooled down. That's essentially social distancing for morons. And that's the thing. Well, you've got a two, you've got your wee square that you've got to stand in. And there's two meters between each side so if you stand in that square someone has to stand in the other square and so on and so forth that is social distancing broken down as best as i can and i really do think that we should stick with it because it is working it's helping stop spreads of infection it's helping lap with people with mental illness and personally i think it's one that really has to say now, the cons are obviously people don't understand social distancing in a pandemic, so how the hell are they going to do it once this is all over? I totally understand that, but maybe with a little bit of practice and a little bit of gentle nudging with a police baton, then maybe, just maybe, they'll get it. Another point is home working. Anne Guthrie has also commented saying, home working has been amazing. Now, I do agree with that, that uh, working from home, has been really good. Traffic's a lot quieter. Well, there's less pollution in the air because there's less cars on the roads. Well, I mean, you only have to look at the weather during lockdown. The weather during lockdown has been bloody lovely. Well, it's such lovely sunshine. You've been able to get, in my case, get the kids out in the garden, take them out for a walk, get them playing with outside toys. It's been brilliant. Well, but there is cons around it because certain jobs 
don't have working from home options, my own job included. So I still have to commute well, daily into the city centre and back. However, people who have been working from home have found it very beneficial, not only for a productivity standard, but also for their mental health. So if your job can be done at home and you can achieve that balance, because I know that some people with young children do struggle to have that balance. I mean, if I was working from home, well, I would make, I would really struggle, especially having twin boys trying to keep them essentially under control while I'm doing my work. But if you can achieve that balance and you can stay at home, there's, there's benefits to that. But some people want and need to go to work to benefit their mental health because some people, and I am not including myself in this because I've absolutely hated being away from my family, but some people do want to go to work just to get a break from the wife and kids. Now, once again, not me. When my three weeks ended and I had to go back to work, I absolutely hated it. I hate being away from my kids. I hate being away from my wife. But I am a home bird. But at the same time, could I do my work when the wife and kids are around at home? Probably not. So it's a necessary evil for myself. But if you have the option to do it, I suggest you take it. Another advantage of the lockdown has been reported from Kerry Ann Wright is that having video conferencing with GPs has been a massive boost. Now, I've tried my best to stay away from the, uh, the GP practices and surgeries like the plague throughout this because I really, really don't like my GP. I really don't. And it's mainly because they don't actually do anything. I mean, they're about as useful being shut as they are being open. Because you phone up, what, and they say, if you've got a cough or cold, what, speak to the pharmacist. What's wrong with your eye, phone the optician if you've got something wrong with your mouth, phone the dentist. So they're already giving you loads of different ways to say, we're not going to deal with you, fuck off. And then eventually when you've worked out all this and go, well, maybe I do need to speak to a doctor, you press the button, you're in a queue for about an hour and a half and you're paying for this. You're paying to wait for a doctor to speak to you. Well, and most of the time when they do speak to you, they just say, we've already booked all our appointments, you'll have to phone back tomorrow. And you have to go through the rigmarole again. You have to phone at eight o'clock or half past eight to try and get all this done again. And it's a fucking nightmare. I mean, it really, really stresses me out. So much so that I went without my antidepressants for God knows how many years because I did not want to go to my GP. I refused point blank. So I don't know how the video conferencing has been working, but if people are finding that better, good luck to them. I'm going to lump these next two points in together because hopefully a couple of them will be relatively easy to follow. So one of them is no unnecessary travel. Now by that, I mean... Do you really need to have three holidays a year? And I'm talking like abroad holidays. What do you, can you really afford the time and the plane fares and the air pollution to, uh, because you really, really desperately need to go to Benidorm or Tenerife? Have a, have a honest think about that and an honest discussion with yourself and go, is it really worth it? I know that everybody needs a holiday. I totally understand that. And I know that I am not a big fan of going abroad. If anybody's listened to my parody, I don't like holidays, you'll definitely understand why I don't like them. But at the same time, what the amount of air travel, the amount of pollution that's been coming from that, and you've noticed the difference in the environment like, since everything's went down. So what would you rather? Would you rather make sure you've got a world to see a bit longer? Or do you really have to go three flights a year to essentially God's waiting room? So the next point is I don't want to see any mass gatherings for as long as I live. Now by this I mean things like, you know, house parties or people going out into the what, big grassy patches of Kirkwood and getting absolutely steaming on Buckfast. Yes, I'm talking to those 30 people that were absolute bellends and put 
our town to shame during this lockdown. I do not want to hear about any house parties, any lockdowns, any social gatherings, any empties, whatever. I do not want them to carry on. Because, quite frankly, people are arseholes. Now, I'm not talking about a person. A person is smart. But the second you get into the realms of people, they're dumb, panicky animals. And I include myself in that as well. I mean, having, having a family get together while at someone's house, that's fine. I'm perfectly okay with that because, well, you can eat that during the day, have a nice bit of lunch, you get the nice weather, you can go out the back. Jobs are good. Empties and house parties where oh, you just basically act like a 14-year-old Ned when really you're in your 50s. You can kindly spin on my middle digit. Don't want to see them again. Really hope the police keep busting them. Because it's really been getting on my nerves, especially when people have been breaking these lockdown restrictions. Because what part of no one outside of your own household is allowed in your house, do you not fucking understand? I get that it's tough. I get that everybody's going through a really hard time right now. But the key point is, everybody is going through it. It's not just you. You do not need to have outside people in your house every bloody day. You don't know where they've been. You don't know what they've been in contact with. You don't know if they've been bringing in something that could affect you, it could affect your kids. Or you could be giving something to them and they could be going to an elderly relative. So you could potentially, from that line of succession, you could kill a member of your family. Now I know that sounds bloody harsh, but we're living in a fucking harsh reality right now. I've not seen my mum and dad since this has began. My kids have not seen their grand and granddad. They're two. They don't understand what's going on, but they still miss their grandparents. Now as much as me and Alison have wanted to buckle and go, you know what, screw this. Mum, Dad, come down. The boys are really missing you. We need you. We've held firm because we have to. We don't break the rules because we fucking feel like it. So take that little bit of advice and make sure you stay indoors and you stay away from people while you can. Because as much as I hate fucking High School Musical, we are all in this together. And we're going to get through it. Yes, it's taken longer than expected, but we'd rather it take its time to make sure we can all meet again safely than have it lifted early and most of our family are missing. So please, for the love of God, just think about that before you think, oh, I need someone to take my kids off me. Finally, one other thing that I really would like to see is the end of 24-hour shopping. By this I mean that the Tesco warehouses, Tesco Expresses, as the 24 hours, they're no longer 24 hours during the pandemic. They have opening and closing times so they can restock the shelves in peace, so they can perform their health and safety checks, and they get a bit of peace and quiet. Now one thing this pandemic has really taught us is that we don't need 24 hour shopping. We don't. And it's only been a real fad or like a craze since the start of the 21st century because before that I don't really remember 24 hour shopping and it didn't affect us in the slightest it's not like I woke up at 2 3 in the morning and went oh I really need to go to Tesco and get myself an ice cream that's not the type of world that we should live in it's consumerism at its worst and I think personally when this is all over we shouldn't have 24 hour shopping We've shown we've been able to cope without it. Yes, some people are queuing up outside Tesco at half past seven in the morning for an eight o'clock opening and it's queued right round what, the car park. But if you keep things like that in place, it's just it's starting to become more of a norm. It's starting to become normal again. So I would really encourage what, shops to keep that trend going. Don't all of a sudden go back to 24 hour shopping when this is all over because the retail staff need a break. They've been put through the ringer with us, trying to make sure that we still have food, water, essential supplies, dealing with a lot of abuse from a lot of people. No one deserves to be abused at their job. Not one single person should go to their work feeling afraid. And it brings me to an additional point that your NHS workers, carers, truck drivers, prison officers, retail staff, give them the fucking respect that they are due. They're putting their lives on the line so that we can still live ours. They deserve 
pay rise. They deserve to have any debts that they've got. They deserve to have them wiped clean. They deserve to be treated as the heroes that they actually are. Because when you look at it, the upper class went into hiding. Middle class, same. Working class, keeping this country going. We really need to have a massive change in this system that's been broken. Because I heard that they've cleared £13 billion of debt for the NHS. No, my key question. How the fuck did they get in that debt in the first place? It's not because like, the NHS spent over their budget. So the government have underfunded. And I want you to think about that. Everybody says that our health service is the best in the world. And as much as I do have my own issues with the NHS, I 100% agree. They do an amazing job well, in the shittest of circumstances. Especially right now. See this whole clapping for carers thing? While a nice gesture, you know what would be even nicer? Show them actual support. We shouldn't be having to rely on 100 year old war veterans to raise money for the NHS. The NHS is not a charity. The NHS is a fundamental essential service. That's becoming our new normal. We really need to have a look at ourselves and go, what has happened? Now we move on to the theme of tonight's episode. And tonight's episode's theme is comedy. We'll be having an interview with Chris Thorburn later on in the show, but I'm going to do a wee selfish plug for myself and promote my Ginger Parodies album. This is a song, it's a parody of a Dr. Dre track that features one of my best friends, John Steele. Expect insanity in this very aptly named More Episodes. Oh my god, I went and bought myself a new TV. Oh, new shows. Trying to decide which streaming service is right for me. Oh, mate, we are living in an age of television. Why bother going outside, man? Pass me the remote, get the planner at the ready. We can read you and me, yeah, what should we do? Go for a run, have some fun, maybe hit the drive through Don't wait, don't I stay and wear nothing but socks Spend all day binging shows on my Android box So many shows on the planner that I need to retrieve When TV's this good, then why should I leave? I've got Amazon, Netflix, Google, Chrome Disney Plus, Now TV, so much more There's thousands of shows and movies on demand You can watch all your programs without any ads You can stream them for free but the link's not protected You're in trouble now cause your hard drive's infected So many options from the comfort of your home Cinema used to be the king but TV's taking the throne Used to love DVDs but that's a thing of the past DVDs obsolete, sorry nothing will last I have to disagree, there's nothing wrong with Freeview TV. Are you nuts? Mate, it's no for me, the whole point of Freeview is that it's free. Some people can't afford the luxury of streaming sites advertising TV. Look at the money spent and add it all up. You could spend over a hundred pound a month. That's money I could use to buy a month shopping. Or pay my council tax and stay the channel hopping. And if your internet connection's running slow, it takes two days to watch a 20 minute show. Free views on the channels that I need, like Dave, E4, BBC, ITV, 1, 2 and 3. That type of fleecing it doesn't sit with me. So get the boys run, get the game on, get the drink suit and the popcorn. Oh, you're still hungry? I got a foot long. I brought my DVD case for home, so sit back and enjoy the next episode. Wait, hold on. Me! For all the bangers who think we are pure skin, we don't. Hey. For shows we're gonna watch once and forget, remember when you used to go out with your mates and play pool, so go outside. Cause you can always watch the next episode another day. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the poor unfortunate soul who is tonight's special guest. Chris, welcome to the show. First question for you is, when did you decide that comedy was the career for you? Hi Andy, uh, thanks for letting me be a part of your show. Um, c career is a strong word, uh, but um, I, I, I guess I, I decided that I wanted to try stand-up comedy 
it must have been about uh, 2012 or something like that. Uh, it was around about the time, um, it's going to sound weird, but I first got Spotify. And um, on Spotify, they, th this was before, uh, you know, Netflix really started doing stand-up comedy specials. Um, that's now the thing. Before that, uh, you know, on Spotify, you had uh, this big library of sort of um, comedians, especially American comedians, uh, with their stand-up comedy albums. And um, it, it's through that that, you know, discovered people like uh, Patton Oswalt, uh, Maria Bamford, Kyle Kinane, uh, and even going back, you know, those early uh, Steve Martin albums. And uh, people like Mitch Hedberg, um, and uh, you know, just kind of opened up a a whole side of stand up comedy that you didn't really see on telly, and got me really interested in that. And uh, I, you know, decided you know wanted to try doing that for myself. So I'd say it was right about then, right about twenty twelve. What would you say has been your best and worst comedy gig so far? Uh, that's a really good question. It's a really difficult question. Uh, I, um, I, I, I also think there's maybe a difference between, you know, best and, uh, favourite. Um, off the top of my head, I'm, I, I'm not gonna pick one. I'm gonna cheat. I'm gonna, I, I'm gonna pick a couple. I'm sorry. Uh, but I, I uh, probably, uh, when I first, when I did my first hour, uh in march 2016 uh, for the glasgow comedy festival uh i did a show called sorry it's my first time doing an hour and uh that was really nice uh just for a variety of reasons i wasn't sure if i could do an hour and i did and i had a lot of fun doing it and it was with a really nice uh you know sold out room uh, we did it at a bar called the griffin uh just off Saki hall street and uh yeah just a room full of uh you know like you know friends and um and, and, and the other folk and it was a really nice audience and i had a really nice time doing that uh or um or uh last august um last august um you know me and uh the sort of comedy collective that uh, i'm with chunks we uh put on shows and uh, last august we did a one-off show uh monkey barrel uh comedy club uh it's a, a fantastic comedy club in edinburgh uh they're wonderful uh but we did a one-off show there started at midnight uh went on till three in the morning and it might be the most fun i've ever had doing comedy and uh it was with you know a group that i really love and i had a lovely time doing that um so probably between those uh or, or or if we're just talking about a more uh, a more straightforward uh doing a spot at a club uh maybe again probably uh last august uh j just because it was a nice surprise uh i i was out with a friend of mine and uh i got a message from a uh, fellow comedian paul mcdaniel he's maybe the funniest man i know um and he said there has been a pull out at the stand comedy club uh can you get here for nine o'clock and that was quite exciting because uh, normally when you do the stand comedy club you know you know ages in advance and you prepare for it this was get across town and as soon as i got in i grabbed the pint and somebody told me you're on next and so you know it was all very quick and you know went on and um something about the night you know just really nice audience and uh i, I, I you know, just feeling loose and had fun, and uh, it was one of those times that I really thought to myself, "Oh, I feel really grateful uh, to do this." Uh, so yeah, th those are three that I've given you instead of one. And uh, worst gig and why? Uh, is, I mean, that's also a difficult one because um, because really bad gigs are kind of fun. So my worst gig is probably not the worst i've ever my, my least favorite gig is probably just one time that i've forgotten about where you know just, i wasn't feeling it and you know went up and did 10 minutes and 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 felt felt nothing and went home um and probably did just okay uh because if you really die a death that's kind of funny and there's something so uh i'd say uh, off the top of my head uh either uh it was um again last uh no sorry uh 
not the last Edinburgh Festival, but the one before, uh, I did a, I did a run with um, my friend John Agassild. We did the double header where, like, that's when, um, you know, you each share a show, you each do half of the show. And uh, I had a lovely time doing that show with him. But then on the very last day of our run, um, it was pouring down with rain. And then uh, we discovered, oh my gosh, we've got a full room. The room is fully sold out. And nobody in that room could have been under the age of 75. It was exclusively pensioners and none of them liked what we were doing. And it was a long 45 minutes. And um, where the only when the only person in the room laughing was each other you know like uh, when john was on i was in hysterics in the back of the room and likewise i think because we had heard each other we'd heard each other's routines every single day for about two weeks uh but but now just in this room full of old people quietly hating us it was just hysterical uh so either that or uh in my first year uh years back um it's booked to do a show uh in kilmarnock uh in a pub it's what i call an ambush gig uh where like um basically like I, I, my definition is an ambush gig is when uh you're doing a show just in a pub and it's not in a private function room it it's not in a dedicated venue it is in a pub full of people who are not there for the gig and the gig is happening against their will and uh, they've been ambushed by comedy so the audience isn't enjoying it and the acts aren't enjoying it nobody's enjoying it um so uh this was that in Kil in a pub in kilmarnock uh and it was in october uh so it was around about halloween and so the show had been called the laughing dead um and what we hadn't realized was a large percentage of the audience that were in this pub uh had uh, just attended a funeral for their friend and now they were having comedy thrust upon them called the laughing dead and uh we all had a terrible time and uh yeah that that, that th those two are pro probably the worst i mean yeah with coronavirus obviously destroying life as we know it at the moment, how have you had to adapt to the changes on the comedy circuit? What's been very nice about the sort of Scottish comedy scene is that um, uh, almost instantly, once uh, gigs stopped, uh, people you know started um, people started like finding other outlets or other ways to still do what we do um and so that's been uh that's been quite nice especially because there's you know people people there's been very little in the way of say you know f financial compensation anymore uh certainly uh some y you do still have you know some things being put on by comedy clubs online that are paying but it's nowhere near the same amount but people are making content and they are putting on these live stream gigs and what's quite nice about that is, is i mean obviously you know we would all very much like to get paid but uh it's nice that, you know we're, we're, people are just doing it out of the passion of doing it you know uh, because we genuinely enjoy this and so the landscape certainly changed. Now there's a lot more podcasts uh, or people are doing uh, sort of online game shows or um, because, you know, uh, doing doing comedy online is definitely different. Uh, you can't just do your regular sets uh, in your room on your webcam. It feels different. So, so um, it certainly changed that way. But it sort of pushed us to become a little more creative uh, in that respect. You recently danced in a dinosaur outfit to raise money for charity. Uh, I've got to ask, how did that come about? How much exactly did you raise? Are you planning on doing anything somewhere down the line? The uh, dinosaur thing. Um, what, so uh, basically uh, what I did was... Um, 
uh, I danced uh, on, I, on, over Facebook Live. Uh, I one Friday night, uh, I uh, wore an inflatable dinosaur suit and I danced uh, for what wound up being uh, just shy of two hours. Um, and and uh, what we did was, uh, you know, it was a soundtrack uh, selected entirely by friends and family. And uh, what I did was, uh, it was all to raise money for the Trussell Trust, uh, which is a fantastic charity. Uh, they're supplying to food banks all around the country and, uh, you know, off the back of this, you know, like you know, this recent, um, you know, situation, you know, a lot of people have went about out of pocket, um, you know, and, and they've been, you know, sort of relying on food banks and uh, so, you know, just uh, trying to raise money for that. Um, but I'd be lying if I said that the process was I'd like to raise money for the Trussell Trust. How do I do that? It was the complete other way around. I had I was bored and I had this inflatable dinosaur suit lying around, and uh, I I saw all this wonderful stuff that people were doing live online, and uh, the wonderful wonderful inventive creative stuff. And I thought, what is the dumbest thing I can do? And then. Off the back of that, I, I like the interactive element of, oh, what, what if I get people to choose the songs? And then off the back of that, it was just, well, this has to be worthwhile for something, so let's raise money for a good cause. Um, it was a lot of fun. It was exhausting. Uh, I was very warm. Um, and, uh, and, and throughout the course of it, uh, my wife and my friends uh, were very worried about my safety because... Um, Certainly, uh, you ran the risk of getting dehydrated in that very hot inflatable dinosaur suit. And also, uh, towards the end, one of the songs that was requested was the 1997 version of Candle in the Wind by Elton John. And as part of that, I lit a candle while wearing that um, very flammable dinosaur suit. And so people were very worried that I was going to hurt myself. Uh, but I didn't. Uh, we did it, and the final total raised uh, was £398, uh, which I'm very happy about. Uh, I do want to take this opportunity, though, to say that uh, the, week of the, uh, the week of the show, I uh, did a radio interview uh, on a particular radio station, uh, and the host in question uh, said on air that he would donate, and he didn't. I'm not naming any names. I'm just saying, if he had donated, which he said he did, which he said he would, live on air, um, we would have been over four hundred. So um, yeah, so just shy of four hundred, which I'm very happy with. Uh, but um, you know, nobody's forcing him to donate. But don't say you're going to donate live on the radio and then not do it. I would say, um, but no, no. Uh, so, am I going to do anything similar down the road? Um, I don't have any immediate plans, but let's see how long this uh, lasts for and um, how bored I get, because I might, I might do something similar again, because I did have fun doing it, and there are other songs we can do. And I know that you're always a very busy man, even in the best of circumstances. Do you have any upcoming events or gigs in the future? For example, podcasts, live streaming. Something that people can look out for um, uh, this coming Thursday. Um, this coming Thursday, uh, I will be on a show called Smack Talk. Uh, that's uh, run by Monkey Barrel Comedy that I was talking about earlier. Uh, it's a sort of roast game show. Uh, four comedians uh, compete uh, with uh, insults, uh, creative uh, funny insults. Uh, and yeah, uh, it, it, it's just fun, uh, and, and, and um, yeah, so we recorded that uh, on Friday, that's going live on Thursday, uh, as well as that I also appeared on um, Quarantine Time, which is a podcast run by uh, The Salon, that's Emily Benita and Rachel Ann Clark, they, um, they run a wonderful gig at the old hairdressers in Glasgow called The Salon, uh, in, in lieu of that, they're currently now doing a podcast. Uh, so I, I guessed it on that, and um, yeah. So uh, and so, those are the two in the immediate future. Uh, I'll also be we'll also be doing another uh, chunks live stream soon. So uh, look out for that. Uh, but yeah. Anyway, thank you very much.
fantastic. Chris, it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you. Thank you so much for agreeing to be part of that Mental Ginger Show. Well, sadly, that's all we've got time for today. I hope you've enjoyed the first pre-recorded That Mental Ginger Show, and we'll leave you with a piece from David Westwood of the Robert Burns Appreciation Society in Airdrie. Thanks for tuning in. Stay safe. Stay well. Goodbye.